A July 4th parade is shattered by another U.S. mass shooting. We ran behind the building and I put my, my son in a dumpster. A well-hidden gunman, a high-powered rifle, and tonight, more grieving families. Also tonight, global airport chaos hits Canadian long weekend travelers even harder. So because our flight is late, we're going to miss the other flight. So we'll have to rebook everything. And a musical twist on Shakespeare with a Canadian creative touch. It would be nice if there's a little more pride for the talent that we have here. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Police have captured the man suspected of firing into a July the 4th parade in a community near Chicago. It's the end of an urgent chase after the latest mass shooting in the United States. At least six people dead and dozens injured. It happened as families, many with young children, were watching parade floats. And it follows recent shootings at a grocery store and an elementary school. Chris Glover looks at what happened this time. First, the gunfire blended with the sound of the marching bands. Oh, 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 oh. But confusion quickly turned to panic. Oh, Parade goers realizing they needed to run from an active shooter. Oh. This boy was one of many to capture the chaos and his fear. No. Oh, my God, it's got shot. He and his family raced inside a nearby store for cover. Oh, man, I'm freaking out right now. There was a gunshot. We're watching the show, like, you know, those people do the cool stuff outside, but no, they started doing, no, we heard gunshots. Multiple witnesses reported the shooter was on a rooftop overhead, something the police later confirmed. We started shooting again, and we ran behind the building, and I put my, my son in a dumpster, and um, he sit there with his dog. Signs of just how quickly people fled were everywhere, <laughs> as emergency responders rushed to save who they could. The parade was approximately three quarters of the way through uh, when the shooting occurred. So uh, very random, very intentional, uh, and a, a very sad day. An urgent manhunt intensified when police found the rifle, but not the gunman. Of the dozens taken to hospital, at least four children, one as young as eight. Listen, there's been a, a lot of different events that have happened in the United States, and, and this obviously now has hit very close to home. It is a little surreal to have to take care of an event such as this. Our community was terrorized by an act of violence that has shaken us to our core. Condemnations from leaders with July the 4th in mind. You all heard what happened today, but each day we're reminded there's nothing guaranteed about our democracy. Highland Park is an affluent city near Chicago, the backdrop for a version of the country portrayed in films like Home Alone. We finally got our mass shooting, unfortunately, which is just horrendous. Now just the latest to experience America's plague of gun violence. Chris, this sure has been moving quickly. Uh, what can you tell us about the arrest? Absolutely. 22-year-old Bobby Cremo was spotted, Ian, roughly 20 minutes north of the parade route by a neighboring police unit. And the suspect was in his silver Honda Fit. That officer tried to stop him, but the suspect fled, and there was a brief car chase. A number of other officers in the area jumped in to help in the chase, and ultimately, they got the 22-year-old suspect to stop, and Cremo was taken into police custody without incident. The police chief said Cremo has now been taken to the Highland Park Police Department, where he will be interrogated, but stressed there is still a lot of work left to do in their investigation before charges will be laid, Ian. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. There's a curfew tonight in Akron, Ohio, after demonstrations over the police killing of an unarmed black man. About 50 people were arrested during last night's protest. Demonstrators were reacting to the public release of graphic police body cam video. It shows eight officers shooting at Jalen Walker after he fled a traffic stop last week. The officers involved have been placed on paid leave. Let's turn now to the chaos at airports, not just here, but around the world. After two years of pandemic restrictions, demand for summer travel is back, but many workers are not. And it all amounts to this. Crowds of travelers stuck in lines, facing flight delays and cancellations. Ithil Musa shows us passengers who are losing patience and some workers taking a stand. 
weekend of long lines, cancellations and delays didn't improve Monday for many Canadian travellers. This woman is trying to see her family in India after seven years. Yeah, our flight has been delayed uh, to Toronto. So because our flight is late, we're going to miss the other flight. So we'll have to rebook everything. So it's going to take us many hours to be back to our schedule. In fact, when it comes to flight delays, Canadian airlines and airports topped a global ranking this past weekend. According to the tracking service FlightAware, Air Canada ranked number one in delays on Saturday and Sunday, affecting hundreds of trips. WestJet was third for delays on Saturday, and Toronto's Pearson International Airport claimed the number two spot on Sunday. At the heart of it all is a widespread labour shortage. There's not enough baggage handlers to deal with the baggage. There aren't enough flight attendants to make the flights. There aren't enough pilots. There's not enough people to maintain the airport desks and DSs. So the reality is they've had to cancel flights repeatedly because not enough people are showing up to do the work. There was a wave of retirements during the pandemic, and a lot of people switched careers. And some say not enough is being done to keep workers who are there. If you want to be first, and you want the employees that are out there, you have to pay them for it. That's the big takeaway from this one. Paying airline workers more isn't just a Canadian conversation. Pilots at Scandinavian airline SAS just went on strike after wage talks broke down. There have also been strike actions in Spain and France. And in a global industry, the ripple effects can reach Canada. I'm a very patient person, but then um, all these flights, of course, they take a toll, toll on you and it hampers your, um, your, all your plans. Yeah, yeah it is uh, disruptive. It is stressful. So, Ithil, lots of theories on how to get air travel running smoothly again. Take us through some of, of what you've heard. Yeah, Ian, you know, one expert we spoke to suggested making it easier for temporary foreign workers to come to Canada to address those labour gaps that have been causing chaos in airports across the country. Another expert insists it's simply about paying workers more, even for just the summer months, to help keep staff and perhaps even lure some people out of retirement. Now, that would mean more labour costs for airlines, but the question is, how do those costs stack up against the losses due to cancellations and bad publicity? Ian? All right. Thank you. There was a major step forward today in a multi-billion dollar compensation plan for First Nations children. The federal government says it signed a final $20 billion agreement for young First Nations people harmed by Canada's discriminatory child welfare system. The government says it's the largest settlement agreement in Canadian history. It has to be approved by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and Canada's federal court before the money can be distributed. That agreement is one of several topics expected to come up at this week's annual Assembly of First Nations gathering, but a brewing leadership crisis has cast a shadow over all of that. Olivia Stefanovic now on growing tensions amplified by new allegations over the weekend. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hey. Today should have been Sorry. about murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. I'm standing here today to be the voice for my children and those we've lost. Chantelle Moore's family and supporters were here to demand justice for her shooting death by police two years ago. But voices like theirs are being pushed aside. Instead, the week-long AFN conference is threatened to be overshadowed by its leadership crisis. It's going to be a distraction from, from a lot of things that people want to get done for, for their communities. Please welcome the first female leader of the Assembly of First Nations. National Chief Roseanne Archibald asked the Ontario Superior Court last week to overturn her suspension, made by the AFN Executive Committee after she shared confidential information about workplace harassment complaints filed against her. The judge said the issue should go before chiefs in assembly. She's going to, I believe, overcome the efforts to try and silence her. Her lawyer says she's being targeted for demanding financial accountability. Over the weekend, she made confidential information public that she says shows corruption in the organization, alleging that several recent contracts granted by the AFN were in violation of ethical guidelines. She wants an independent inquiry and forensic audit to look into it. These contracts raise questions that need to be answered. The easiest way to answer them is through forensic audit. 
but most people hope the rest of the week's agenda isn't sidelined. We need to keep focus on what we're doing and the reason why we're here. And Olivia, what's expected to happen tomorrow? Well, Ian, I'm holding a briefing note that the AFN Executive Committee is sharing with members of the Assembly tonight, and it's, it's expected to be discussed first thing tomorrow morning. It contains a summary of Archibald's behavior from the executive's point of view, everything from when workplace complaints were filed against her back in May to attempts by the committee to try to stop her from disclosing confidential information, such as information about contracts. Now, two regional chiefs from the Assembly of First Nations are expected to, disclose, to discuss the contents of of this document tomorrow, then Archibald, who is in the fight for her political life, Ian, is expected to address the assembly. At the end of all of this, it will be up to chiefs who are gathered here this week to decide if she stays or goes. Olivia Stefanovic here in Vancouver this evening. Thanks. With his trip to Canada just three weeks away, Pope Francis has revealed new details about his health issues. Lentamente, no? Eh, tecnicamente, he told Reuters in Italian that he's slowly recovering from a knee fracture that forced him to cancel a trip to Africa. He denied rumors that he plans to resign soon. He also said that after his trip to Canada, he hopes to become the first pope to visit Moscow. Francis said he wants to help with peace efforts. A U.S. forensic report into the death of an Al Jazeera journalist has done nothing to settle a highly charged issue. Shireen Abu Akla was caught in the crossfire in the West Bank in May. Today, the State Department said the bullet that killed her was likely fired from the Israeli side. Sasha Petrasik shows us the fallout. It's up! The questions started as soon as Shireen Abu Akla was shot, who fired the fatal bullet. This video, showing her amid gunfire from Israeli soldiers on one side and Palestinian militants on the other, led to few answers, but many angry accusations. Palestinians charged that Israel deliberately targeted the Al Jazeera reporter because she was Palestinian. Israel denied that, but conceded its forces may have accidentally hit her as they chased militants, Israel accuses, of deadly attacks on Israelis. Or it says those militants might have hit her. Two months later, Abu Akhla's colleagues in the West Bank watched as an American examination of the bullet said it could not reach a definitive conclusion on who killed the journalist. U.S. experts say gunfire from the Israeli military was likely responsible, but there's no reason to believe it was intentional. Al Jazeera's bureau chief says it's up to Israel to prove its innocence. Abu Akhla's family calls the results an insult to her memory. From Geneva, her niece says the International Criminal Court should now take up the case. We continue to call on the UN and the ICC to carry out an investigation and hold Israel accountable and put an end to this grotesque impunity that Israel continues to endure. Israel's defense minister says his government will continue its own investigation, one that's likely to raise tensions even more. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Denmark say there's no indication Sunday's shooting was terror-related. Three people were killed and seven were injured when a gunman opened fire at this busy mall. A 22-year-old Danish man has been arrested and charged. Police say he's known to local mental health services and is being evaluated in a psychiatric ward. Tonight, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, said his country has no choice but to break the Russian military invasion after Moscow claimed another victory. Margaret Evans has the impact in Ukraine and beyond to the fall of Lysychansk. To the victors go the ruins. Lysychansk, the latest Ukrainian city laid to waste by Russia. Now little more than a carcass, the city's fall over the weekend carries with it nonetheless a larger prize for Moscow, complete control of Luhansk. Today, Vladimir Putin congratulated his soldiers for what he described as liberation. 
Some of those still in Lysychansk appeared happy to see the Russians. I think the Russians are like me, says this woman, and I'm like them. Others chose flight, now displaced in a city to the west. Lysychansk doesn't exist anymore, said Nina Bondar. It's practically been wiped off the face of the earth. But even as the war rages on, no end in sight, dozens of countries, including Canada, met in Switzerland to discuss Ukraine's eventual reconstruction. There were more harsh words for the Kremlin. They want to undermine Ukraine's very existence as a state. Ukraine wants more than words, especially, says the Prime Minister, if it's to win back lost territory. Because now we need next supplying of weapon to stabilize the situation on the front line and then to try to uh, push them back and win the war. Ukraine is outnumbered and outgunned in the Donbass. Residents still left in cities like Sloviansk, close to the border with Luhansk, and already under fire, are bracing for more. In neighboring Kramatorsk, the mayor says there are around 60,000 people still left in the city, for now. After attacks on Kramatorsk on Sunday, he says, and the attacks on nearby Sloviansk, people are starting to pack up. Some will be leaving for a second time, having already fled once only to return. Life as a refugee, hard to sustain. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Analysts say Ukraine's retreat from Lysychansk isn't a decisive blow, but it does raise questions about how and when Ukraine will be able to stop Russia's advance in the Donbass. Russia's slow advance over the past several weeks has picked up speed. Since May, Russian forces in the Donbass have achieved a string of victories, allowing them to close in on Severodonetsk and then Lysychansk. Ukrainian forces have reportedly fallen back to defensive lines here. They've lost more than just territory. That has been incredibly harmful for the Ukrainian forces, holding and fighting in that pocket. They have suffered enormous attrition. There are signs Ukraine is responding with those new Western weapons systems. This unverified video purports to show the destruction of ammunition stores deep within Russian-held territory. And the big unknown, you know, we, we just, the thing we just do not know about is the state of the Ukrainian forces. The war in Ukraine, not just about lines on a map. Flooding has forced tens of thousands of people on Australia's east coast out of their homes. I had no idea it was going to come up here. Some areas received a month's worth of rain over the weekend, swelling rivers and triggering floods for the third time this year. The weather so bad, authorities had to call off a plan to rescue the crew of a stranded ship. More rain is expected all week. Tonight, many Canadians are grieving the loss of a legend in broadcasting. Patrick Watson was a groundbreaking CBC producer and host in the early days of television in this country. For seven decades, in those roles and others, he fought for the values of public broadcasting. This hour has seven days. I'm Patrick Watson, and this is our report on the... This hour has seven days spoke to Canadians like nothing before. Launched in 1964, it mixed documentary material, satire, and original music to review the news of the, the week and often of week to criticize the, the powerful. It was immensely popular, but by its 50th episode, it was canceled because it was so provocative. Watson has said his early years at CBC were marked by a culture of adventure. Now, people were prepared to take risks and were encouraged. He went on to produce prestige television and created a cultural touchstone, the Heritage Minute that valorized Canada's past. He served as chair of the CBC, but left in the mid-90s disillusioned by budget cuts. No matter his many achievements, people always asked about this hour has seven days and why it worked so well. And in terms of having an effect on the attitude of audiences towards issues of social justice and democracy and establishments versus little people and all that stuff. That was very thought out and I don't remember our feeling at all that it was unlikely to succeed. Not for a minute. Patrick Watson was 92. 
Canadians turned to RVs in the early days of the pandemic as a vacation alternative. But now some are thinking twice about hitting the road. This year, they're quite scaled back, mainly because of the cost. Up next, what the high cost of gas could mean for Canada's RV bubble. Plus, why more Canadians aren't yet eligible for a fourth COVID vaccine. The protection against severe COVID is still very preserved, even uh, at 150 days or longer after that third dose. What you need to know about waning immunity. And later, a Canadian musical debut. It's been really nice bringing the show to my home. The search for international recognition off-Broadway. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Canadian consumers and businesses are both feeling extraordinary pressure from the rocketing inflation rate. That's according to StatCan's regular quarterly survey of each group. Businesses say sales are growing after the long pandemic drought, but for many, demand exceeds the clogged supply, and that only boosts inflation. Consumers don't think wages will keep up with the rising prices, and they're cutting back where they can. That's quickly becoming a roadblock for people who love their recreational vehicles. The pandemic gave a boost to the RV market as wide open spaces became more welcoming. Now Aaron Collins shows us how gas prices and interest rates may lower the boom. It's a sure sign that summer has arrived. RV owners getting ready to hit the open road. This home on wheels has been to pretty much every corner of Canada. We figured that we've got about 400 square feet in here. But high gas prices will keep trips in this rolling condo closer to home this summer. This year they're quite scaled back and um, mainly because of the cost. We're thinking twice about taking trips. It's not stopping us, but we're definitely thinking twice about what we're going to do. Well, that could signal a shift from recent years when a record number of RVs hit the road. 600,000 motorhomes and trailers were built in North America last year alone. What we've seen over the past couple years is that the pandemic has supercharged that, that long-term growth. It's been busy at this RV lot just outside Calgary throughout the pandemic. Everything from vans to luxury motorhomes have been hard to keep in stock. This one's got the televator TV there that's uh, with the fireplace oh, entertainment. The I love it. But sales have begun to slow a bit this year. Some buyers reacting to higher gas prices. Still shopping, but looking for a smaller, cheaper RV. People are being a little bit more fuel conscious, and I think the industry has been going that way for a long time with lighter materials and a little bit of stuff that's easier to tow. And it's not just fuel prices that could have new RV buyers thinking twice down the road, creating worries about an RV bubble ready to burst. Rising inflation, rising gas prices, rising borrowing costs, so all of these factors will be things that can consumers will take into consideration. And with so many RVs now on the road, if demand were to collapse, it could mean a bumpy ride for anyone looking to ditch their RV for good. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, diagnosing prolonged grief. Intense yearning, longing for the deceased person. Yes. And preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person. I'm going to say, of course. A look at who will benefit from classifying this new psychiatric disorder. Plus, what Canadians need to know about a third and fourth dose of the COVID vaccine. Dr. Chagla breaks down the numbers. Welcome back. The very personal act of grieving was really pushed into the spotlight by the pandemic as people struggled with so much loss, often alone. Now it's getting renewed attention because of a new entry in the manual, often known as the Psychiatry's Bible. It now lists prolonged grief as a disorder. And as Christine Birak explains, that is a controversial move. It's 
coming up on 11 years that next week that she passed away. So this time of year, I, I get triggered. Yeah. Just End of June is when my mom died. Oh, is that right? I'm sorry for that. Every person on this hike in Toronto has lost someone they love. Yeah. You feel like you're on an altered universe. You really do. It's a shock. It, it all sucks. <laughs> oh, it all sucks. Grief is a journey, and people take different paths. But can someone be grieving for too long? I'm not ready to go through that yet, to look at it. No, it took me a very long time. The American Psychiatric Association recently said yes. People can now be diagnosed with prolonged grief disorder. Even among psychiatrists, it's highly controversial. You shouldn't get a mental disorder diagnosis because you grieve for someone you love for more than 12 months. This isn't about attaching labels to people. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're trying to figure out is who can we help and how can we help them? And recognizing this disorder it is a step in the right direction. Researchers insist prolonged grief disorder applies to a small group of people who are experiencing intense distress for at least a year after the loss of their loved one. But others argue this disorder is medicalizing and even stigmatizing normal human emotions. Our first year, I kept thinking, if we can make it past this first year, things will be easier. But it doesn't get easier because there's still, it's still his birthday, even if it's not the first year, it's the second birthday or the third birthday or the fourth birthday. It's still his birthday, it's still Christmas, and he's still not here. Paulette Hope's son, Jeff, was 34 years old. He died suddenly in the summer of 2015 from complications relating to diabetes. It was just in his sleep and they said very quickly, and it was his heart. Her grief didn't end after a year, and she's not sure it ever will. Because your grief is your grief, and you don't have any control over how that affects you. No matter how many books you read or how many counselors you go to or how many people you see, it's still, it's still your grief. This is a debate that stretches for decades. Dr. David Greitzer is a psychiatrist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. This is the new version, which is DSM-5-TR. This is the first update in nine years. Prolonged grief disorder has now been added to psychiatry's big book, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, or DSM. It's a, a collection of uh, disorders and descriptions. Researchers estimate prolonged grief affects roughly 10% of people who are grieving, putting them at risk of poor physical health, shortened life expectancy, and suicide. Some people might have a major loss and they're back at work after a month, and others might not. Uh, and there's no right or wrong. But there is clearly something a little different when people have struggled more than a year and they're not functional, which is what this disorder is about. Treatments can include targeted psychotherapy and medication, which can now be covered under insurance. A diagnosis that works very well in the hands of experts can be an absolute disaster when it hits the real world. Distress is part of the human condition. Dr. Alan Francis is a psychiatrist and professor at Duke University. And some of them will definitely need and benefit greatly from psychotherapy. Talking about the grief is, is usually the best way of coming to terms with it rather than hiding it. But he thinks drug companies will benefit more from this diagnosis than those who are grieving. For them to be told, oh, you're mentally ill and most often you need a medication it is, I think, disgraceful in terms of uh, disrespecting the love that they felt for the, the person who's, who's lost. I lost my husband and my future, like pretty much in, in about a second. Justine Silver's husband, Stuart, was only 44 years old when he died in 2011. He, uh, he was throwing up, which is a sign of anything. We, we thought, and we were, as we were talking about, like, should we take him to, you know, a family doctor or whatnot, he, uh, he died, like, in the middle of our conversation. I feel like I can 
put his stuff around me, you know, like... I Doctors told her it was a heart attack. It happened years ago, but she still wraps herself in his memories. I would like to say I did not use all of his genes. There were another 18 pairs. And here we are up on our chairs. You can see we're just like having such a good time. We're so happy. And, Silver uh, didn't think she'd just, meet the uh, criteria for prolonged grief disorder, but it's broader than she thought. I know it's hard to remember, but give me a sense if these criteria you would say yes to a year after Stuart's death. Intense yearning, longing for the deceased person. Yes. And preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person. I'm going to say, of course. Intense emotional pain, anger, bitterness, sorrow related to the death. Can I say, duh? <laughs> like, of course, of course you're having all those things. But they're just, they're a normal reaction. The biggest fear I have of someone being given that diagnosis is that they'll feel like something's wrong with them. They'll feel like um, they're not grieving right, that their experience isn't uh, normal. We tend to be really death denying and we want people to get over the grief quickly. So I think, I think there's an opportunity for education as well. Kathy Kitely is a bereavement counselor and educator. She feels the prolonged grief diagnosis can help a select group of people, but most people who've lost someone need our patience. They can't be pushed to be okay or move on from their loss. It is necessary to feel the pain and that pain can be all over the map. Anger, frustration, guilt, sadness, remorse, many different feelings, but they have to be experienced. Especially when you're bereaved and everything's awkward and new, you can make such a difference to be around other people. The controversy around prolonged grief disorder is an emotional one. Those who have lost someone don't want to forget them. They want to keep their memory alive because their love continues to live on. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Along with prolonged grief, there has also been a lot of suspended grief in Canada over the pandemic. Restrictions and fears of infection prevented many people from holding funerals for their loved ones. Funeral directors say they're now holding services for people who passed away over the last two years, a way for their families to get some closure. When we come back, mounting questions and concerns about when Canadians should line up for their fourth COVID shot. Those over the age of 60 or 70, those with immunocompromising conditions where their vaccine responses may not be adequate, absolutely need that extra protection. So how protected are you this summer? Dr. Chagla joins me to talk about boosters and immunity and later. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh, oh my gosh, Sonia. Two friends, one boat and a moment they won't soon forget. While Canada is still fighting the COVID pandemic by one measure, we may be falling behind, vaccinations. And this is despite some early success. Canada has done pretty well. We've done very well with our immunization strategy. You have to recognize that we have done extraordinarily well. But after most Canadians got two and then three doses, eligibility varies widely for the fourth. For instance, in Ontario, it's ages 60 and up. Here in BC, 70 and up. In Quebec, it's open to all adults. And across the country, so far, less than 10% of the population has received a fourth shot. So do you need one? Let's bring in Dr. Zane Chagla, an infectious disease specialist with St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. And Dr. Chagla, a lot of variables here. Let's start with people who have had three vaccine doses. What is their level of protection right now? So we can break this down into protection against symptomatic infection and protection against severe disease. Uh, so symptomatic infection, you know, is really time dependent. So when people get that third dose, there is waning that occurs over 20 weeks. We're at about 20 weeks, according to data from the UK. Uh, people have lost really a lot of that symptomatic protection. That being said, the protection against severe COVID, so ending up in the hospital, needing oxygen with COVID pneumonia, is still very preserved, even uh, at 150 days or longer after that third dose. And, and again, we see this in 
what's happening in real time in that you know younger immunocompetent populations are not landing in hospital uh, after being vaccinated and boosted. And I guess a quick follow-up to that for those people out there who were really diligent about getting the first two doses but didn't get the first booster, the third dose, you would say to them in a sentence, get it. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, you know, if you've not had COVID before, it's an important piece. Uh, It really does boost antibody levels and solidify that protection. Getting two doses is important, but getting that third really does complete the series. All right, let's talk now about the fourth shot or second booster. It's complicated, but let's, let's call it the fourth shot. Based on the data that you have seen, who needs that fourth shot? So these are the people that are overrepresented in terms of breakthrough infections that lead to hospitalization. In Israel, they study this extensively. They were the first country to do this. And in those over the age of 60, they saw a very low risk of hospitalization uh, in one study, 0.01%. Still, you know, a a good number of people, because that is a large group, uh, that was reduced by 50 to even 80% over time for severe complications of COVID-19 when getting that fourth dose. And so those over the age of 60 or 70, those with immunocompromising conditions where their vaccine responses may not be adequate, absolutely need that extra protection. But again, it's taking a low risk of hospitalization and making it even lower. And so when we apply it to the general population who's already at low risk after their third dose, the marginal benefits may not be there. Uh, and, uh, And again, really, focusing on people at the highest risk, which is probably the way we're going to be moving forward with vaccinations. So here in Canada, the age eligibility for that fourth dose is different from province to province. And so there are a lot of people out there who aren't eligible in their province for the second booster, the fourth dose, and they're kind of worried. Are they protected enough without that fourth dose? Yeah, if you look at ages, you know, the under the age of 60, we really see very, very few hospitalizations in boosted individuals. And so if you look at in Ontario's data, for example, there's been 100 people admitted to the ICU uh, of the over 50% of the adult population and 40 people that have died who have had a booster dose of COVID-19. And some of those are people who died with COVID-19, not from COVID-19. And some of those are people that are immunocompromised. Uh, who are eligible for a fourth dose. So, you know, I think we have to take that in the magnitude of risk. Those over the age of 60, those with immunocompromising conditions, they suffer the most from this disease and need every protection in terms of vaccinations, treatments, and other therapies. But those under the age of 60, really, who are immunocompetent, are not really represented in healthcare. Uh, and, and again, can be assured that their three doses really keeps them out of, out of the hospital. I'm going to do an unfair thing here. I really only have 30 seconds. What about people who have had the three doses and have had COVID during the Omicron wave? What's their level of immunity? Again, if if you're in a vulnerable group, it's not a bad idea three months after that COVID episode to get your fourth dose. Um, But again, they probably do get offered a booster level protection from having Omicron as well. It's nice to talk to an infectious disease doctor who's looked at the data. Thank you very much, Dr. Chagla. All the best. Another COVID note, Nova Scotia will drop most remaining restrictions this week. Starting Wednesday at midnight, people who get COVID will no longer be required to isolate. The exception is for residents of care homes, shelters and prisons. Masking guidelines will also shift from strongly recommended to optional. Up next, a modern take on one of Shakespeare's classics with a Canadian connection. We're so self-effacing and self-deprecating. It would be nice if there's a little more pride for the talent that we have here. The Canadian talent on and off the stage and their high hopes for success. We'll be right back. Renowned Canadian artist David Blackwood is being remembered today after his death on Saturday, including in his home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. There's no one else who's made work like David Blackwood. He is a unique voice in Canada and in Newfoundland and Labrador. He is a part of this place. He is a part of the story of this place. Blackwood was best known for his prints depicting traditional outport life in Newfoundland. His work can be found in galleries all over the country and around the world too, including in the Queen's collection at Windsor Castle. David Blackwood died at his home in Ontario after a long illness. He was 80 years old. A musical with strong Canadian ties that became a hit in the UK has made its debut in Toronto. And Juliet, 
a modern take on the Shakespeare tale, was created by an Emmy-winning writer from Schitt's Creek. Lisa Shing shows us what it means for the Canadian team members to bring the show home. These undeniably catchy pop tunes from songwriting legend Max Martin are woven into And Juliet, a modern take on Shakespeare's tragic love story. Nothing compares to, to this. Brandon Antonio is from Toronto and never expected he'd be in a Mervish production for a hometown audience dancing to music he grew up with. This is all I've ever known in terms of music, in terms of where I grew up, like setting and everything, and it's, it's come full circle. Also full circle for and Juliet's creator and Torontonian David West Reed, the Emmy-winning writer and executive producer from Schitt's Creek. It's been really nice bringing the show to my home and to get to kind of feel the, the warmth of a Canadian audience that hasn't seen a lot of theatre recently. And his musical that spins the tale of what Juliet's future would be if she hadn't ended her own life first debuted in London, England, and after this Toronto run, hopefully Broadway. It is sometimes hard for Canadians to find um, that international stage. <laughs> In the last few decades, shows like The Drowsy Chaperone and more recently Come From Away found their way to New York City, but it's tough, especially for smaller productions. We've got theatre second to nobody, and yet trying to get the federal government or even the provincial government to recognize that is like talking to people who've never been inside a theatre before. Shalene Huda has been auditioning in New York City for years. It's extremely frustrating. It's extremely disheartening, especially when you're starting out. But there are plenty of productions that found success elsewhere, like Dixon Road, that tells the story of a Somali family in Canada, or Anne of Green Gables, the country's longest running musical. I wish Canadians had a little, uh, you know, we're so self-effacing and self-deprecating. It would be nice if there's a little more pride for the talent that we have here. And there's lots of it, even if it doesn't make it to Broadway. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. What would you do if you came face to face with a humpback whale? <laughs> a once in a lifetime encounter is our moment. Next. Lauren Lan and Sonia Shum were on their way to a cabin just off the coast of Vancouver Island when a humpback whale seemed to take an interest in their boat. So close they could almost touch it and even smell it. This incredible chance encounter with a curious whale is our moment. Did you see the <laughs> Because it was such a nice clear day in flat water, quite far away, we could see the blow of a whale. And yeah, about five minutes later, Sonia, he Sonia, came up Sonia, like Sonia. right beside the boat. And no, I don't know so if he was trying to scratch himself or what, but he was definitely making contact with the boat. You could see along the, the ridge of this whale, he had like notches in him. So he must have had contact with boats before, but he obviously wasn't scared of us. And we've affectionately named him Stinky because I don't know how you would know this if you're never really that close, but humpback whales stink. <laughs> I've been out on the water quite a lot over these last 10 years and seen a lot of whales and never, ever, ever seen one this close. And so I feel like it was maybe a once in a lifetime thing. That is really so humpbacks are huge. I mean, look it up. It, it's amazing how big they are. It was a chance encounter. Not sure why the whale was there. And yet, when you look at those pictures, it's so graceful and so serene and almost as if maybe there was a connection that the whale felt with these humans on a boat. Anyway, beautiful video and uh, what a great moment for them. That is the National for July the 4th. Good night.